Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> Great. Well, uh, good evening and thank you uh, for, for, for coming in. Uh, thanks. So we have, um, I guess, about an hour uh, to talk a little bit about the, the peer index story. Let me just kick off with um, maybe a, a more realistic uh, introduction than the one that Matt has, has given me. Uh, thank you. My mum would be jealous of the quality of that introduction. Uh, so I've, this is my 21st year in um, uh, working since I graduated. Uh, I've been in the tech industry pretty much throughout that time. Um, I actually started as a journalist covering the tech scene for The Guardian and for The Economist. And at that time, there wasn't really a tech industry in the UK. There certainly wasn't a startup industry. There was sort of Amadeus and 3i ventures. Um, and once a month, the people involved in the UK internet scene, uh, most of whom were sy systems admins at the one of the two ISPs that existed at the time, would meet at a pub uh, in, in Houston. Um, it was a really, really tiny scene. I was very young in it. There were people who knew um, a, a lot more about it, but it was a really uh, kind of great starting point because there was a lot of demand for, for the skill set. And, and so starting off as a journalist, I was lucky enough to help launch The Guardian's first websites and The Economist's first websites. Um, before I switched into um, a much more entrepreneurial space, uh, and my, my actually my first entrepreneurial venture, apart from ones I la launched at high school and at university, uh, was a dot-com incubator uh, for my sins. Those of you who remember the dot-com bubble, the bubbliest part of the bubble were the incubators which were building uh, more startups. Um, and uh, that, was, that taught me a lot, a lot of lessons about timing uh, as well. Um, uh, so just in terms of uh, my... Um, presentation. I'm pretty strong on analogies, particularly as I get tired. Um, and I'm quite cross-disciplinary. So you might find some strange analogies coming out. I'm just giving you a warning there. Um, I'm also extremely bad at PowerPoint. So I did my best, sort of, uh, with these slides. Um, you'll, you'll find presenters which, with much better slides. Um, my newsletter, you can sign up. The URL is azim.io slash s. That URL will appear later in the talk as well. Um, and, and so, you know, having been an, uh, an entrepreneur and working in some exec, uh, exec roles in startups for a few years, I sold my company, Peer Index, which we'll talk about uh, at the end of uh, 2014. Uh, and a couple of weeks ago, I started working um, at Europe's, one of Europe's largest media companies called Shipstead, uh, where I'm running a product group building uh, new digital marketplaces. Um, I am hiring product managers, so those of you who are graduating in July um, and are interested in moving into tech uh, uh, and have a relevant skill set, um, lots of requirements there, uh, please drop me an email. So uh, what I thought I would do is uh, have sort of four sections. So the first and the meatiest part is really the peer index story. Um, I guess it's it's something that many previous tell speakers have talked about, which is their sort of journey through their businesses. Um, and uh, you know every story is very personal. So please take what you <laughs> want out of it. There aren't really general uh, uh, general lessons from it, but there are specific uh, lessons. Um, I thought it might be worth spending a bit of time around what's different now. I mean, I alluded to nineteen ninety four in London tech scene, but even when I set up Peer Index in two thousand and nine, the world was very different to the one it is now. Um, and, and I had a chance to reflect on founder lessons. Um, and I looked back at my email to Matt, and I was like, I'll just do seven lessons. So it can be like seven samurai or seven brides. Um, it's more like 17. Uh, and I kept thinking of more as I was uh, uh, typing them out. Uh, so there are some founder lessons. But I think most interestingly is, is um, just for us to have a discussion afterwards. While I'm talking, if you do want to ask a question, please just pop up your hand. And if, if it's a good time, we'll take it. If it's a question that's better dealt with later, I'll do that as well. But I'm, I'm really happy to take questions uh, as we go. So um, Peer Index was a company that I founded um, in 2009. And it was acquired on December the 20th, uh, 2014. Um, uh, so it was a, around a six-year journey. Uh, it didn't actually start as Peer Index. So like many, um, like many startups, it started somewhere else. And, and actually, it started, went through this. Uh, the first iteration was called VBrief. 
it became views flow, it became peer index, it focused on a product called peer perks. We then built a new product called PyQ, uh, which was then acquired. And it had two major pivots uh, during that time from views flow to peer index and from peer index to PyQ. But in that time, there were very, very many iterations. Um, I mean, iteration and exploration and minor pivot was just the, the business uh, uh, cadence that we ran to. Um, the, the, I think the core message about what peer index really was, was that it was a very um, early uh, in the history of sort of, uh, you know, the, the current vogue for machine learning, uh, a startup that relied very heavily on large scale machine learning. Um, and it was that technology and engineering depth that really drove us to be able to build a great product that um, uh, facilitated an acquisition. So this is um, where it all began. Uh, uh, back in early 2009 with this site called vBrief. Um, v as in very and brief as in brief. It was a clone of a website that existed at the time called Dig, which actually may still exist. Uh, uh, Dig, I, don't, I can't remember. Um, and, and the idea essentially was to look at the enormous information soup that was out there of content on blogs and, and media sites and find some way of aggregating it down so that the best was available for you to read. Um, I'll re return to this theme about news aggregation uh, later, but the, the instinct that we had was that Dig had been really, really successful as a mass market product with a, with a um, you know, very large audience into the tens of millions. Um, and as a result, it was quite tabloid. So, so my thinking was, let's try to build something that zeroed in on a really high value vertical and use kind of community dynamics to uh, essentially build a, a meta economist. I mean, I'd worked at The Economist, so I sort of uh, understood the dynamics there. Uh, and so we came up with vBrief. And, and just to give you a sense of, of, of what this involved kind of cost wise, it's a dig clone. It was coded by me with some open source software. I had a guy in Egypt on about $6 an hour doing a little bit of the, the HTML and CSS for me. It was really, really rough. And it was tested out to, out, to about 150 people. Uh, and uh, when I say tested to about 150 people, about half of those I you know, met personally and talked to and got feedback from. Um, and uh, the rest kind of came in and, and sort of found their way in with a little bit of early testing uh, that we did. It was quite difficult back in those days because Twitter was really tiny um, and Facebook didn't have an ads platform. So the things that you would do today to generate a small audience to test a proposition, uh, you couldn't do back then. Uh, and, and actually testing often involved having to get on the bus and going to see somebody, which is a real pain. Um, there was enough of uh, an interest and a kind of bite around people saying, this is starting to solve a problem for me, uh, for me to go out and you know, pull together a, uh, a small angel round of about a quarter of a million pounds um, to build uh, ViewsFlow, uh, which was the, the new name of the product. Um, and uh, this was when I started to pull a team together. So I, I got a, a great head of product called Simon Cast. If any of you are interested in product manager, management, regardless of whether you want to send me your CV later, um, he runs uh, Mind the Product, which is a big product managers conference now. So he was a really great find, and we worked together very happily for a number of years. Um, we, we, Used, we had to hire external developers, so um, it was really tough at that time in London. 2009, post credit, cr uh, credit crunch, people were a little bit risk averse, actually probably kind of a bad time to start a company. Um, and uh, finding the developers quickly was quite difficult uh, at the time, and I think that's another thing that's changed. Um, but I did happen across uh, quite an amazing uh, machine learning uh, expert, really, really great uh, computer scientist who had actually been working at Twitter and had been their first data scientist, but had had to leave for visa reasons um, before he got his equity as well. Uh, poor guy. Um, and what we built was a platform that was much larger than, than vBrief. We were able to track hundreds of thousands of people. And if you does anybody here use a site called Flipboard, a service called Flipboard to read their news or Apple News, right? So this is essentially what we did, right? We, we basically figured out how to crawl Twitter in 2009, hundreds of thousands of sources, and algorithmically rank the stories and present them back to you, the best stories at the, front, at the top, um, and start to personalize that. Um, 
we were much earlier than, than most of these guys. What was interesting and we discovered was um, users really loved it and we really had some good traction. So all of the tests that you, you might learn about product market fit and traction, many, very many of them were satisfied by views flow. So we had um, increasing numbers of re uh, registrations. We had people coming back to the site really frequently. Um, but really no business model. Uh, and the London venture capital scene at the time was pretty small, um, much smaller than it is now. And they, they quite rightly, as it turns out, didn't really like the model of news aggregation. The, model, the, the point being that in order for this to succeed, you either have to deliver premium services, and very few people have succeeded in doing that without an editorial staff, or you have to grow really, really big. And, and it's been proved uh, correct. I mean, news aggregation has really turned into an absolute utter cemetery. Uh, so Prismatic, which raised $15 million in Silicon Valley a few month, few year after us, uh, shut down recently. Um, it's just a really, really hard uh, segment to go and crack. So just a note to anybody here who's thinking about news aggregation, please don't come to talk to me <laughs> about it. <laughs> just save your time and my time. Um, because uh, my advice is, is really not to touch it unless you really, really have some special source like, you know, Rupert Murdoch's your granddad or something. Um, I'm afraid I don't have any screenshots of views flow, uh, but I can't even find any on, on the internet archive, so I can't show you uh, what, it, what it looked like. So you run into this situation where you're, you're starting to build a team and you're starting to do all the things that teams do. So we're doing offsites, we're doing kind of leadership profiling, we're getting to learn about each other, having a few arguments, um, you know, having team drinks and, and wearing silly hats. Um, uh, but equally, you're running into the situation where it's going to be hard to get any kind of follow-on funding because you don't have unit economics that can persuade a VC, nor do you have insane retention that could persuade a VC. And you've got to contextualize what was happening at the time, 2000, late 2009, back in the annals of history. So Facebook was doing quite well. People still thought there was room for other social networks, but just not in Europe. Flash sales sites, guilt.com, were all the rage. So Von Privé and a bunch of other of these, these sites um, were being funded heavily. And that's the thing that was driving it. And Groupon was kind of nudging around as the next big thing. And of course, the venture scene is somewhat driven, let's not call it by call it fads, let's call it ebullient themes. Uh, and so you can sometimes miss your window of opportunity or hit your window of opportunity uh, really well. So, so then the question is, you know, what do you do? Because you've definitely got something here and, and you then start a process of, of exploring. So we did have one thing in ViewsFlow. Nikete and I had worked on an algorithm uh, and the, the algorithm had to solve this problem, which is that um, we had to solve the problem of, of the hundreds of thousands of articles we're seeing every day, which ones are uh, interesting? And which one's gonna be interesting to you? And should we trust what Matt has shared on venture capital or should we not? So we built this algorithm called Peer Expertise Evaluation and Ranking. And it's kind of nerdy because Peer stands for you know, Expertise Evaluation of Ranking. And it was basically patentable. Um, and it turned out to be really valuable, interesting, and defensible, because we'd solved the problem of the question, who should, who's, whose opinion should I trust on the subject of venture capital? And it was a really early machine learning slash data defensible business. And so we pivoted into, uh, into a company that we then called Peer Index. Um, we didn't pivot fast enough. That's another lesson we can talk about. It took us about three months to make the decision when we'd figured it out after three days. Um, uh, and we, we did this pivot. And so we started that in about March 2010. We sort of rolled it out in December 2010. And so this became Peer Index. And it was really just a showcase of the technology. So you could, you know, we were tracking 7 million people and you could type in your name and you could find out how well our algorithms had scored you a little bit like, a, like an experience score only for the stuff that you were saying on social media. Um, and we started to talk to people about what the business model like, might look like and what products uh, might, might look like. Um, and these are a few screenshots of it from 2010. So you'd have you know, your username, you'd connect your Twitter profile. Does anybody here use Twitter or still use Twitter? Because it's kind of just actually out of interest. How many people use Twitter? 
And how many people, okay, hands down, use Snapchat? <laughs> yeah, rest my case. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we can't do anything with Snapchat, but this is what it started to look like. And um, what happened uh, at the time was there was only us and another service called Clout, uh, which was in a similar space. And people who were active users on social media loved it. And those active users were journalists and bloggers and kind of tech people and social media people and, and influencers. Um, and, and, you know, we, we just threw this out, getting the technology working, talking to marketers, talking to application developers about how they might use the technology, the technology commercially. But the site was growing uh, in terms of user registrations and by the standards of the time, very, very fast. Sorry, pardon me, yeah. Um, in terms of uh, actual uh, patent, yeah. when did you file for it? So we filed a provisional um, in the middle of 2010, uh, and we never followed up on the, on the filing because we just, we, it, it was basically going to be a case of resources and time and attention and a team of seven or eight. So patents are... I, I think they're a very strange and complex beast for startups. I don't think the answer is always file or never file. It's always something in between. Um, we, we filed a provisional. It was something you could show venture capitalists for a while. And then, you know, yeah, potentially if I had like six man weeks and 30,000 pounds, I would have prosecuted it, but we, we didn't. Yeah. Um, so, so it was growing really fast. And we used to track um, uh, our activity using a, a, a new product called Chartbeat. It's new, it was new then, it's now six years old. And we would regularly max out our previous records on Chartbeat. And it's an incredibly thrilling time, that moment when you come in and nobody's like, no, everyone's really intense, but nobody's doing the work that was allocated at the start of the week or the start of the month, because we're just trying to keep the service up and deal with queries and deal with user registrations. Um, and, you know, more screenshots uh, from the dim and distant past. Uh, the team became really, really motivated. So the success and the engagement bred success and people started to work really, really quite long hours. So, you know, I would say that my developers very rarely did anything less than a 15 hour day. Uh, and so we, they were incredibly productive and we just started pulling out more and more little apps um, there. So the great thing about having uh, quite a lot of traction is that you have an excuse not to put any effort into your slides. So <laughs> this is a slide from an investor deck. Uh, and you know, you'd never put anything like this out there. But my excuse was, I'm sorry, we're really busy growing really, really fast. So I didn't do any time, put any time on the slides. Um, and, and you know, you can sort of see a, uh, a, an, an uptick that's starting to look really, really healthy. Um, what was quite interesting at the time, and this is another challenge I think for entrepreneurs, is um, at the time there was a vogue for consumer companies to develop APIs that developers could use to build applications. So Twitter did it, Facebook did it, Foursquare did it, and so every blog was talking, every, by every blog I mean all of TechCrunch, was constantly talking about this new API model where you could, you could push out your data, make money that way, grow your ecosystem. Oh, look, ecosystems work for Microsoft, therefore they can work for you. And this is like a siren call. And unfortunately, we're not smart like Ulysses, and we didn't strap ourselves to the mast. Um, so we did develop an API, and it was actually doing pretty well. You know, 75 developers on it, um, you know, nearly a million requests for our data uh, every single month. Um, so you get into this really nice uh, rosy picture. It doesn't always stay, stay rosy. I don't know if I mentioned to you, but I'm hiring product managers. So when people graduate in July, if you do have the right skill set for being a product manager, you can drop me an email there. Um, so we, we, uh, we're getting this momentum. We raised a little bit more money, um, and we started to transition the team. Uh, so we were still about five people, and we were absolutely knackered. Uh, and some of the my developers were based in Slovenia, had been, been brought in house. So we started to the, started the process of kind of scaling up the team, getting a heavier weight CTO and director of engineering, building two development teams, bringing them in house and co-locating them, bringing on board a, a sales lead. Um, 
It takes a hell of a long time. I mean, it took us nine months to build the, a strong back-end engineering team, uh, which, uh, you know, in startup time is just, it's just kind of insanely long. Um, it just takes time because the skills are hard to find, or were hard to find at the time. So we're getting towards the, um, the tail end of, uh, of 2011, so we'd launched in, in, in December. Pardon me, yeah? Well, I'm just getting there. Here we are. Da -da. Perfect question. Timing. Excellent. More questions like that. So, um, uh, so what had happened during that time was we'd been, we'd, we've got all this data about people, and we've been talking to a lot of potential customers in the market. And we, um, we identified through lots of conversations and lots of testing that uh, marketers were really interested in connecting with influencers. What they wanted to do was they wanted to, they knew how to reach high journalists and celebrities, and they knew how to read the mass market through their mass channels, but finding influencers, people who are passionate about cooking, or people into urban design or, or CrossFit, was really, really difficult, but was much easier on social media than, than it, had, it had ever been. So we, and we had the technology to identify them. But at this stage, we were identifying, indexing 20, 30 million people on Twitter, and we could answer the question to Ford, in this case, Ford was la launching a new urban car. Who's going to find that interesting? And who's influential in that, in that area? So we started to deliver a program where we would connect influencers to marketers. So what you can see up here is Reebok CrossFit. So for Reebok, we identified um, 150 people who were active on social media and into extreme keep, keep fit and CrossFit style things and Reebok delivered them a CrossFit training experience on, an, on a no strings, no obligation basis. But these people were, you know, extremely keen social media sharers. So when given something nice about a subject they loved, their immediate reaction was to pull out their smartphone and start tweeting the hell out of it, um, uh, which, is, which is then exactly what Reebok want, wanted, which because then their trainers are everywhere. And, and in the case of Ford, it, it was really interesting because Ford were just incredibly creative about the launch of this mid-tier car. Um, and they went off and got some uh, hologram company in Boston that worked for the, the Pentagon to build holograms of this car to deliver to our influencers. And about 100 people created videos of the unboxing experience at home of this, of this what was effectively a Ford brochure. Uh, so it worked really well. And we saw um, some really great uh, sales traction. So we, we closed 2011. Uh, signing a significant contract with Ford. Um, and so at the end of 2011, we, we had this brilliant year where uh, we had won the Europas, which are some startup awards. Uh, we were kind of constantly in the press and on the blog, uh, blogs. Um, we had lots of front page stories. We had a 16 page supplement <laughs> about us in the independent, which was uh, kind of mental. Um, and our API, was now doing nearly 10 million calls per day. You remember in my first slide, it was nearly a million a month. We're taking it up to about 300 million a month with more than 400 developers using it. Um, so you really feel you're getting a lot of traction. We closed a, a Series A of a, a few million dollars. Um, and we started to build uh, the tools that you needed to professionalize your, your product. So here we, we are with, this is an extract of a campaign reporting. This is for the Ford campaign. Um, but your work is never done. Uh, you, you've, you're not freezing uh, any part of your business. We now have a sense of what our business is. We, we index consumers. We use a lot of technology to do that. We give the consumer some benefit in that if you're a professional blogger, you get to understand your, your impact. Uh, and we, we then help connect brands to you on a permissioned basis. I mean, it sounds, it sounds really nice, but you don't stop your... Um, your testing. So this is the Peer Index homepage in mid 2012 on one particular day. We were cons constantly testing our homepage, sometimes dozens of variants a month, to see how that affected signups and bounce rates. So I don't know how long this was live. Was it live for an hour? Was it live for a week? I don't know. It was one of many, many tests that the, fr the front end team would have run in order to optimize our customer end user acquisition. Uh, Hiring product managers, you knew that. Um, 
so this is another test of our homepage. And again, I'm putting these tests in to show you how different they are because uh, even three years into a business, you, you, in a company like this, you constantly have to test some of your really big hypotheses, but also your smaller hypotheses. So this looks like a very much a really different homepage. There's no science behind this. There's no articulation that says, hey, I think we should have a picture on the homepage. What happened was we generated 30 or 40 different ideas for what a homepage might look like. And then we created more combinations of them and we just ran them through and tested them in a, using A-B tests. Um, and, and this is, again, this is what, how the site had migrated in terms of a visual design. So we felt that the old design wasn't modern. And so this is one area where we made a kind of creative design choice to say, we need to soften the colors and make it look a bit more human. And, uh, and so we, we had changed the design. I think you'll remember, you may remember that it looked very kind of yellow and as if it had been put together by a, a software developer, which indeed it had been. Uh, and then we just made it a bit softer by the time we got to here. Um, now, we, we're doing some more experimentation. Uh, the reason we're continuing to experiment is that revenue is growing very healthily. So we've done, um, you know, 50K in a quarter. We've done 150K the next quarter. We've done 275K the next quarter. And the pipeline's looking strong. But you still, you know, as soon as you, you get on a trend, there's an old trader's adage. I don't know if any of you were stock traders in the 1920s, but the trend is your friend. Uh, so you want to double down once you've got that upward momentum. So the experimentation continues. Um, how can we increase consumer uptake beyond the high value uh, influencer and audience uh, uh, and, and the professionals? Um, then uh, something happened in late 2012, which was, was quite shocking. Um, uh, essentially, we had a lot of sales momentum from big brands. So Ford, Universal Music, Ed Sheeran, Sony, Reebok, Virgin, lots of the ad agencies. And we had a quarter where we really, really missed our revenue targets. Uh, when I mean really missed our revenue targets, I mean they literally fell off a cliff. Um, it wasn't as bad as the next quarter when I had negative revenue because I had to refund somebody. Uh, but the sales momentum dried up and it was one of the first lessons, really painful lesson actually, that sales momentum doesn't mean product market fit. It means you've got a shiny, exciting product and a phenomenal sales leader who'd built a good team of small team. And so he was able to persuade people to hand over a lot of cash to try something new and innovative. And it was the first time, but not the second time, because <laughs> they'd already tried it. Um, and so there was a bit of a shocker when we, we discovered that the, the mode of excitement had gone out of our buyer. And, and we'd already always known it had been a business model risk because we were selling campaigns rather than sustained subscriptions. But we didn't, I didn't predict that boredom would set in faster than we could find a solution uh, to, to that. Um, so that, that kind of forced us really into a period um, of uh, blind panic um, and uh, introspection and, and then some calm thinking. Uh, and, and some difficult decisions. So the first decision that we made was uh, that the entire team, product and technical architecture that we'd built around this influencer engagement component um, didn't really have any legs. So you go through that painful process of building up the team and getting to know them and loving them and so on and then having to let a lot of people go. Um, ditching the code is not as painful uh, uh, as having to say goodbye to you know people you'd brought in. Um, but what we, where we did have some success was uh, a new B2B hypothesis. Because we, we, in order to identify influencers, we were crunching the whole of Twitter, give or take. And we had hundreds of millions of users in Twitter with detailed user profiles. And a major media firm in New York approached us slightly randomly. And one of my junior sales guys listened to them and heard them and asked some qualification questions. And came back and said, do you think we can do this? And we said, yes, yes, we can. And what they wanted to do was to profile the audience, their audiences, um, their social media audiences using our technology. And uh, over a three to four day period, using way too much Excel for my liking, um, we, we did profile about 17 million user profiles um, in, in the US. And the client bought it. And they said, we would have paid 
you know, double what we actually did pay you. And we thought we were doing quite well, well out of it. And it formed the basis of some very, very fast um, lean, lean startup testing. We took that, that prototype and anonymized data to lots of other media companies. We, we built very fast um, wireframes uh, in, in a tool called Balsamic. Uh, we took them out to as many, uh, no, not as many. We took them out to a large number of potential buyers. And what we did was we went broad. So we could say, well, we've got some broad coverage. And we went deep in two different verticals. So we could say, look, we think people in gambling and people in care homes will, will both want these, these areas. Why didn't we do five verticals? We just didn't have the time. Um, uh, and so, so that constructed a, a rationale for the pivot and the, the, the sort of major pivot in the company. Um, and, and so our 2013 homepage now is not kind of soft and fluffy with a woman making cupcakes. It's us funneling with, a, a, there's a spelling mistake there, traffic to test the B2B hypothesis. So that's it, influence intelligence for brands. And that old consumer proposition where we could tell you about your behavior on social media still exists, uh, but I'm not that interested in it. I'm really interested in, is, do we have any legs there? And within about three months, we have started to say, no, that's what we're really all about. So now the consumer product that had been our life for three years is this one little button here. The rest of this is all about our enterprise product. And up there, the third line across, you can see PyQ. And PyQ was people intelligence, um, and it was the, the product we were going to sell to, to consumer marketers. Um, and we just, it, it, developed from, uh, it developed from there. So now the site is showing off the, the software as a service product. Um, and uh, you know, we, we started to have a, an enterprise class product. Customers really loved the MVP. So we had brands like Unilever and the Financial Times and, and um, Coral Betting paying us hundreds or thousands of pounds a month for an incomplete product because it was giving them something that no complete product could give them, which was an analysis of their audiences built with some of some quite advanced machine learning stuff that the engineers uh, had put together. Um, and the engineers were absolutely phenomenal at that time. They were given a lot of freedom uh, to kind of work with customers and build, build new things. Um, this, this pivot is now um, sort of August, September 2013. Um, and at that time, I needed to rebuild my sales team because obviously we had lost, got rid of everyone who wasn't an engineer during the, 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 the major pivot. Um, and there was an, an LBS alum actually who joined the team um, and who was absolutely instrumental then in building our sort of commercial base. And actually, we did, we did pretty nicely. We had a regular growth in uh, recurring revenue contracts. So any of those of you who are like, thinking about going into startups, you'll know it's all about recurring revenue and stacking your contracts up and 12-month contracts. Um, the curve looked really, really nice um, and very healthy. Um, and it was healthy enough that in, um, in late 2014, we had a number of approaches from uh, SaaS vendors, uh, uh, software vendors in our sector uh, to say we're kind of interested in working with you. Um, and one that was doing really, really well based out of Brighton and continues to do phenomenally well uh, with a great CEO was, was Brandwatch. And you know, we had a lot of conversations. We liked the team. Um, and there was an acquisition then at the end of, of 2014. Um, oh, acquisitions is a completely separate, <laughs> separate conversation. Uh, they're fun because suddenly you start to sleep as an entrepreneur. Uh, they're also, they also are kind of replete with challenges because you know, you've got to, you've got to get in, live in someone else's home. Um, and, and so I stayed about a year before I, before I moved on. Um, and I've taken this new role, hiring product managers, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so um, that, was, that was the story of the, of the kind of ups and downs um, and the, ultimately the exit. Uh, I think a few key points there is, is you never stop being hypothesis driven and pivoting and checking and checking your assumptions and killing your babies if you have to. You really have to kind of throw out your best ideas if they're not working. Um, and it's, it's a pretty ongoing process. So uh, I've got a couple more slides. I, if anyone has any questions on that, otherwise I'll just power ahead. Sure. 
were there any investors on the on the journey? Where were they? How much how did, did they give you apart from money? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And we can take it, let's just take it now because you've asked it. We did have um, uh, uh, two angel rounds, um, then a VC round with some investors, and then some follow-on rounds from the same investors. We didn't get enough um, momentum to close what's known as a Series B, right? So we did the Series A, couple of million, follow-on, a little bit. But in order to get to the Series B, we needed to get to revenue numbers that were five to six times higher than we would have got, and we had an acquisition offer as well instead, so we took that. And VCs provide very different things. Um, one of our VCs is just a awesome commercial negotiating deal guy. So he can generally, uh, and has been a software salesperson, so he can look at a complex problem and say, this is how you turn this, what you think is a 5,000 pound deal into a 50,000 pound deal, and create a path to it, and really help you. And he was very hands-on. Um, and then other, other investors are more strategic and conceptual and kind of po connect you to people. Um, and then you have your silent investors. I think it's a, it's a broad church, but the one thing I think you need to do is you need to succeed on the assumption that they're going to be silent. But specifically, when you had the real panic, mm. when you didn't make your numbers, yeah. how were your investors then? You know, um, it wasn't so much that we didn't make our numbers. It was that we got um, absolutely clean, clinical, in-your-face evidence that our hypothesis of the business model was not, was, had been proven, and it had been proven as false, <laughs> right? Uh, that was the real issue, because missing your numbers, you can improve. The issue was more, um, we went out with hi hypothesis to test, which was you can sell influencer campaigns to people on a sustained basis, and that was proven to be, you know, we got some proof, which was you can't do that. Um, they were actually pretty good at that point. They were pretty good, uh, pretty good about you know helping us think through the problem. Um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think it varies. I think as an investor, you don't really have much choice. You have to help people get out of whatever situation you're in. No, because it's equity capital and there's a shareholder agreement. Yeah. So. Yeah. So you know when you were selling data. Yeah. Mm. Uh, it was mm, it was complicated. <laughs> so the question was, when I was selling data to B Reebok and so on, why was it B to C? Um, we didn't sell the data. What we did was we sold access to the influencer. So what we would do is we would use our, our data and we'd say to Reebok, there's no way, I'm going to assume your name is Bob, there's no way of reaching Bob um, unless you have our data to know you should be reaching Bob and not Dave over there. So if you want to reach Bob, and here's why you should, let me send him an email and see if he wants to talk to you. Sure. Yeah. And the other thing I was going to ask was, um, was it, it seems like there was nothing stopping them from getting data from your platform for free. Maybe yeah. No, no, you could get data, um, but you, you couldn't ever get enough. So the amount that you could get, the, the, the class that you could get, get large volumes of useful but low, low value data. Um, and the, the harder pre question, which is, who are the best people for Reebok in Manchester and London involved getting access to kind of our full data stack and being able to ask the question correctly? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to just move on, actually, if you don't mind, because we've got a couple of slides. So I just wanted to talk briefly about what's changed um, since I started, started that. So uh, the ecosystem is much richer and much more supportive um, than, than it was. It wasn't that it was unsupportive and people were laughing at you six years ago. It's just there wasn't that much around. Uh, uh, around. You know, I don't know if many of you have seen Tech Hub, the work, co-working space, or heard of it. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, you know, we were one of the first half dozen tenants there. Uh, so it was, it was very early uh, on. The, the, the crowdfunding, angel funding, incubator funding, and venture funding business is much more robust. So I was in the, one of the first investors in Seed Camp and an advisor there, and it was not even a tenth of what Reshma and Carlos have turned it into uh, now. Um, there are much more experienced people in London now. So when we were building APIs, making buy versus build decisions, thinking about unit economics and A-B testing, not many people were. It was a really, really small, small number uh, who were who are doing that. And of course, now you've got more people like that, which means when you come to build your teams, you can lean on much more experience. Um, 
the Lean Startup that I, I kept talking about. I, just a question, how many of you have heard of the Lean Startup or read the book? So most people. So it was published in 2011. The company was <laughs> nearly three years old when we started. But as I mentioned, my product manager, Simon Cast, was a real, you know, thinking very, very hard about this stuff. And you know, we read um, Steve Blank's Four Steps to the Epiphany, which is a slightly older book on the same subject about being hypothesis driven. So now you get Eric Ries's book and it's got a ton of information and a ton of stuff. And Dave McClure's Pirate Metrics is five years old. But back then, a lot of that stuff was being, was being discovered. And that also meant the tools, the tools that you will use to metricate your tech company uh, didn't exist. So Mixpanel now is like an $800 million valuation company. Um, we were so early using Mixpanel that we used to have to PayPal the CEO's personal account to pay for our service. And we were so early using Optimizely, which is an A-B testing platform, uh, that they, they didn't even have a free service. They didn't have a paid for service when we started, right? Which they now, you know, they now, now charge you $5,000 a month or something. So those tools are available and they, they're, just, they're just there and ready to use. And the knowledge, the, re the, the rationale and the explanation of how to use them is available in, in, in books on Amazon. Um, I think one thing that has changed, though, is there's much fiercer competition. So the bar is higher. So the quality of things that com companies that come out of incubator programs is just amazingly high. Uh, and that, that is tough, right? That is, that is tough. Um, you know, it, it's just, yes, there's more money around. Yes, there are more people. The knowledge is more d d dispersed and diffused. So there's going to be much more competition. Okay, I'm going to whip through the um, 12 or so uh, founder lessons quickly. Um, so nail it, then scale it. Uh, like one of my number one lessons, these are all kind of number one lessons, but nail it, then scale it. So before you start thinking about scale and you start thinking about revenues and you start thinking about break even, is figure out your customer proposition, figure out whether you've got product market fit, and figure out whether there's sustainable unit economics in the business when you, when you get there. Um, it's really easy to scale prematurely because you get carried away by all of the positive noise and the positive vibes that you're getting. Um, the second is test your hypotheses often. I mean, you should be testing some kind of hypothesis, whether it's something as simple as, does this change to our customer service script uh, improve the customer satisfaction or not, or something as big as, are we in entirely the wrong market? And have we made, you know, what's our hypothesis about the market need? Um, and you really have to, uh, to, to build that. Um, sales momentum does not equal product market fit as a strong personal le uh, lesson for me. Um, you know, your product should be able to sell with a terrible salesman. Um, I actually happen to have a phenomenal <laughs> salesman who was just kind of amazing and a great leader as well. Uh, and uh, that masked weaknesses, deficiencies in our offering. Um, we, I, Peer Index was a single founder business. Um, uh, I think teams will generally do, do better. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend my kids found a company on their own. Uh, uh, I, uh, you, you know, it's, it's a really, really long, reasonably long journey. Um, and when you, when you start to build your team, um, you know, you have to overinvest in, in learning about each other's communication styles and values and leadership style and aims and personal histories. Uh, it's just really, really important that you, you overinvest in that because then you can be aware of the, your team members' foibles um, and they're just attributes of them rather than reasons that they're trying to fuck you off. Um, so that's something that's really, really well worth, uh, well worth doing. Um, you do need an, an engineer as a co-founder, at least in the tech tech space. It, it's kind of tough when you've got people wandering around going, I've got this idea for an app. Do you know a CTO? The only, you know, just, it, that just doesn't work. I won't drill into it anymore. But if you are going in the tech space, you need a technical co-founder. Um, again, this is just really thinking about companies, businesses that you might try to get venture, venture backed. Um, the market needs to be big and your economics need to be good. So you should work to um, understand your unit economics really quickly because you'll sell your vision to VCs on your unit economics unless your growth and user retention is insane. So if you have Snapchat's growth and user retention, you don't need to worry about your unit economics. If you don't, then you do. Um, this one's a bit weird. Uh, go as fast as you can slowly. Uh, so that's related to nail it, then scale it. So there's this kind of sense where 
you need to be a bit measured about decisions that you make, but once you make those decisions, you have to work really, really quickly because your, you know, your lifespan is, is fundamentally limited. Um, so some other lessons. Um, so personal networks are a tremendous help. So LBS is pretty good for that, but you know, there is an ecosystem out there and there are people to meet. Um, learning how to position your company and having, being able to tell a story, a narrative of the future, um, is really, really important. Because at the end of the day, you're kind of five people with some shonky technology, with some weird take and a weird market. And that's true for, for, for Facebook as it is for you know, uh, Airbnb as it is for any other of these companies. Um, so having a vision that you can, you can tell and you can tell the story around becomes important. Um, and one of the things that I found uh, uh, was that I, I found myself at the table with CEOs or number twos of like the, some of the biggest companies in the world and some of the biggest ad agencies uh, in the world. And, and the reason is that there is a real premium on innovation and com these companies are looking for solutions to problems they haven't been able to solve. But if you position yourself correctly, I mean, if I positioned, I positioned Peer Index as the way that you can you know, identify expertise and influence in the world, um, not as, well, we're five guys in Tech City in London trying to do this little thing. I mean, that just wouldn't be interesting to, to, to big people. So figuring out your vision and narrative is important. Um, instant success takes a really long time. Uh, and, and, you know, Pinterest is a great example of this. Like they're an overnight success that took five years to get to the night where, <laughs> where it became an overnight success. Um, and and that's, a, that's again related to, uh, you, you know, there's a lot of confirmation bias in the stories of entrepreneurship. Uh, and there are companies you've never heard of, then you've heard of them. Uh, and that's because it's kind of boring watching people hit their heads against a brick wall day after day while they're trying to figure out product market fit. But it's really interesting when they're on that little hockey stick. Um, watch your cap table uh, and have great lawyers. Uh, in the journey that you go on, it takes quite a long time. So you have to have really good contracts in place. Um, it may not be something you want to spend time on. I had phenomenal lawyers. So quick plug, not for the product managers I'm hiring at the end of this summer, but for Oric, who are my law firm, who were absolutely uh, phenomenal for, for five or six years. And having a good cap table uh, and good shareholder agreements really makes life easy. As you get, your company gets older, the cap table may get complicated. And you know, one of the things I did was I had to take a difficult decision to clean it up, which meant cleaning up a cap table. For those of you who've come out of private equity and finance, you know what that means. Uh, it means lots of uncomfortable conversations with shareholders. Um, so people matter a great deal. Uh, and investing in people uh, in the time and giving them a, a mission and a reason to, to turn up to work for you rather than somebody else uh, is, is really important. We did this quite well at Peer Index. I don't think we did it brilliantly, um, but you know, one of the, 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 uh, the, the, the testaments for this is there is a Peer Index Veterans, a PI Vet alumni network, 50, 60 people meet every month, even, even now, um, and you know, go out together and, and sort of uh, even work together and, and, and so on, so, which has been one of the th things that I'm most proud of sort of outside of the full journey uh, in the company. The final thing is that this may be helpful um, and that's to have stamina, grit and determination um, uh, or it may be the only thing that actually matters uh, on, a, uh, on an entrepreneurial journey. Um, it, it, it's, quite, it's quite tough and it does take quite a long time. Even when it's going like swimmingly well, it's quite tough. Uh, but when you come to make tough decisions, um, it gets even tougher. So uh, that is something that is definitely worth uh, working on. So um, it's 10 to 8. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, my Twitter handle is there. My great newsletter URL sign up is also there. Thank you. <laughs> Should we do some questions? Oh, sure. Cool. Any questions? Sure. Yeah. Uh, it was based on that feedback. Um, I think that's where personal networks matter. So I was able to go to people who I'd known for quite a long time and built relationships with over, in some cases, 10 or 15 years. Uh, but, but it was, 
it, you know, they had followed, they had followed what we'd been doing for five or six months and could see there was something there. Yeah. But I think it's really different now, right? Just, it's a much more professional process. Hi. Yeah. In terms of pricing, mm. when you did the rebot, yeah. how did you go about uh, figuring out what's the best price to price your work at? Uh, so we, uh, I mean, pricing a new product is really difficult. So we looked at things that were similar in the market and we tried to look at, um, uh, we, we, and there were similar service offerings, but they weren't technology driven. They were driven by agencies. Uh, and so we decided we would come in below the agencies uh, because then they wouldn't be able to compete uh, on a margins basis. Uh, but we didn't want to, we still wanted to maintain high margins because we thought it was a premium product. So, you know, notionally the margins were, you know, on a per sale basis, 99%. But, but actually we could get away with that because the agencies were just more expensive th th than us. It's not a great way of doing it, to be honest. I mean, I think, I think the better way to do it is to get as close as you can to the money of your customer so that you can tell, sell the customer a rate of return Ca on cash invested argument. So you're saying to them, if you give me a thousand pounds, the thing that I do for you will turn into 2000 pounds within three months. Uh, and that's a much stronger business model uh, to, to aim for. And we tried really hard to find that, but we, we, we just couldn't, couldn't find one that was coherent as a product. Have you changed plans in terms of the pricing model? We changed the pricing model frequently, yeah. So when we were running the, the influencer management camp product, uh, we, we changed it a few times in response to feedback. That's not discounting, it's changing the pricing model. There was also obviously discounting and premium services over the top. When we moved to a SaaS product, we didn't change the pricing. We, we, we were very discovery driven about what people were willing to pay. Uh, and then we, we, we pegged it at that. And we, we, we reviewed it every three months and felt we were still in the right zone. And we started to push it up in fact, actually, so that later customers paid more than earlier ones because we realized it was worth more to them. Yeah. Sorry, there's a gentleman over there. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask a question around the pivot from. Facebook. Could you speak up a bit? Sorry. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question regarding the uh, pivot from Pearsucks to PyQ. Yeah. And like, how exactly did you manage that process of having to let certain people go, hire new people, and then having to integrate old and new team members and going for sort of a new mission? Yeah. It's all very challenging. Um, it, I, I, so the, the one advantage I had is that I'd laid off people a couple of times before. And so numbers of, number of amount of tears shed um, was rapidly diminishing with each successful sort of layoff. But not at Peer Index. I mean, at previous companies. And I you know, had to have those uncomfortable conversations as a manager uh, with teams. Um, it, it, it's, it, so the way we'd set the company up, it just was very clear who was in and who was out because we had this group that was running the perks business and a group of really good back-end engineers and machine learning specialists who were doing all the data. Um, you know, there are a few things that you, um, you, you, you do. You have to go through the kind of right legal process. Um, you have to then uh, know exactly what's going to happen when you talk to somebody and they're going to go through that cycle the sort of stages of denial and anger and, and so on um, and then within the capabilities of your um, within the capabilities of your company you have to be able to be able to provide them some kind of a landing pack so specifically what happened for us was tell them as quickly as you can with a letter let them get out of the office get the steam off we had a an HR guy who had worked with us as a recruiter who was available for helping them with CVs and making calls. I mean, these were all highly talented developers in London. I think they all had multiple offers by the next morning. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, you get to keep your laptop for a little while or in the case of some people forget to return it. Um, so, so that process is, is really, really difficult and scary and um, uncomfortable, but you just, you kind of have to swallow that frog. On the technical side, um, it was, more complicated because on the one hand uh, I need to we need to put all our engineering into the new hypothesis we wanted to test but on the other hand we had this old thing running so you what we did was we put a minimal amount of effort in decommissioning the old services right we didn't decommission them neatly we kind of literally changed the HTML on a page <laughs> so that and all the back-end services were still running because they cost us you know, 70 bucks a month on Amazon um, but, but I think my, my main lesson about, about pivots is 
it's a, it's, a, it's a lot like letting somebody go who's underperforming, right? The general rule you get, guidance you get from your mentors is if you think someone is underperforming and needs to be let go, then they probably do and you just get on with it. Um, with something like pivots, uh, you, it's a little bit more complicated, but I think if it's not working and you don't have a, you don't have a set of hypotheses that give you comfort that you can discover the thing that will work, you'll know quite quickly and you should make the change quite, change quite quickly. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. How about this gentleman over here? Yeah. Well, what drove your move to uh, work at a larger company? And how did you frame your entrepreneurial experience to take you beyond? Uh, yeah. It was. It. So. I mean, they are. So having done a one startup um, of over five years, I was not at the point where I have the intellectual energy to think about another one um, uh, at, at the moment. And uh, Shipstead is a really interesting company in that. They were, they're actually huge. They're the second or third biggest operator of marketplaces and compete with eBay in the world. Uh, reached nearly 300 million users uh, every month. Um, and I, it took a lot of persuading for me to even take the call with them. And then when I met them, the individuals I met and the team that was being set up was, was pretty impressive. So uh, it, it, was, it was quite, I mean, I did talk to a couple of other big companies, but there was something about this being a, a new team significant resources, like hundreds of great developers, and 200 million users I can put products in front of. It's not an opportunity that I'll get in a while. And that was kind of unique to them. But I did talk to some other you know, large corporates. And they would offer like, jobs as head of innovation, which means you know, run around doing PowerPoint until the board gets bored of that unit and then nixes it. Yeah. Um, so Clout was a company that was based in Silicon Valley that was, had a similar, uh, similar offering and a slightly different um, take. They were much more consumer focused than us. They had a really much stronger design ethos and they had $36 million more uh, in cash. I think it was 36. Um, so we are, the only thing we really competed for was mindshare, not for customers because None of their customers were in Europe, and only a couple of our customers were in the US. And, the, our cust and so we just didn't compete commercially. And neither of us had particularly strong, I think, had particularly strong consumer propositions. Uh, so so the, the real issue with having a competitor like that is, is that it occupies a lot of your, your headspace because they're out there, they're pushing out press releases, they're doing new innovations and so on. Um, but they, they turned out, I mean, it turned out not to be uh, much of an issue for us. I think it's different if you're, you know, say you're running a food delivery business in, in London and you're, you know, there's another food delivery business. Like you're competing literally over the same turf, different dynamics of competition. Super. Other questions? Yeah. Can you share what you think makes a good product manager? <laughs> ah. Yeah. Uh, it's quite, it's quite, um, so I think it, dep it depends a little bit uh, on the, uh, the, the state and scale of the company and the quality of the engineering around you. But in general, um, I look for people who are uh, able to think about the end user, the consumer, or the, the end business user, um, and start with a real um, empathy for what they might try to do and how might they might think about the problem. Um, so I, I really like product managers who have a little bit of that kind of UX style thinking. I'm not asking you to be a user experience designer. I'm just asking you to think first and foremost, what does the user want? Because at the end of the day, there are going to be battles between the CEO and marketing and sales and engineering about what should be prioritized. And in general, the only thing that matters is the user. So you have to be able to articulate that. Then you need all the other skills, right? You need to know how to prioritize and run experiments and use all the tools and be good at spreadsheets and be good at communication. But, but I think a, a, an orientation around the, the user is really, really critical. Um, now, it does depend, right? Because if, on the other hand, you're a product manager and what you're product managing, as some people are within, within my company, um, highly technical internal facing products, that's a different skill set. But I, I mean, I couldn't do that myself. So I wouldn't know what to look for. Good. Um, Sure, sir. Do you sell out because 
you could see a flaw in your product or because you were offered an obscene amount of money? Uh, so, not, you know, sadly, neither of those. Um, we sold because um, we, we could raise more money. We had got a lot of the right kind of traction. Um, but a, a few things, a few things come to bear, and not any one of them is sort of enough uh, for it. So one is the team had been doing this for a while, and people were getting getting tired. The second was um, most, and I think this is the most crucial one: customers wanted to buy from bigger companies. Uh, we were a team of twelve, and the market had really, really moved on. So five years earlier, in the social media analytics sector, twelve would have been a big company. Five years on, 900 was a big company. And our biggest client, uh, which was an, a massive and treated us extremely well, uh, uh, FMCG business, uh, really was, was needed more than we could offer as a 12-person company, just in terms of comfort to them. And then the final component was really about understanding where, where the waves of the, the industry was. So, there were no Series A or Series B financings in my sector in the two years prior to our acquisition. There were Series C and Series D financings. Uh, well, there were a couple of Series Bs, uh, but basically there were, there, were, there were none, right? So what had happened was all the Series As and Bs had happened when we had first got our A. And then the, so many companies had died, many had been acquired, man, many had just sort of just fizzled out. And the ones that were coming out at the other end were, C, were getting their C and D funding and getting bigger and bigger. And as we talked to investors, and we talked to a lot because they loved our story of a retained user base, growing monthly recurring revenues, and really high user retention on the app, um, we were just the wrong <coughs> scale for where the bets they were making in those se that sector at the time. Uh, so there was essentially, the cons we were at the consolidation phase of the party. Uh, but we were quite early after the pivot. So all of those things formed a view that in order to kind of maximize the outcomes, this is a good time to, to, to sell the company and to, to sort of move it into something larger, which was privately held and doing really well. And, you know, my shares rise by their efforts now. Um, and, and I think timing is a really, really crucial, uh, crucial part of it. You know, the, so, so for example, Bitcoin and blockchain is quite hot at the moment. Uh, probably, and people who are doing VC will know better than me, at some point in the next three to four years, that sector will start to cool off and you won't want to start a blockchain company because it'll just it'll all be these big companies. You just get these moments. Yeah. If everyone could please uh, join me in a round of applause for Azim. <laughs>